Hello and welcome to Cinema Enigmatico, which is Italian for Obscure Cinema. I am your host, Rigor, and I am here to present to you obscure films and give you my opinion on them. Some would say that I'm dumpster diving for movies so that you don't have to, but that's really up to you. As I said, this will be my opinion. Oh, and by the way, you're not going to find any big budget Hollywood movies reviewed here. Sometimes these films aren't always the greatest, but you still may have fun watching them. Here at Cinema Enigmatico, we rate movies on a scale of criteria that determines if it's crap or not crap. We'll outline our rating system and rate the film after the synopsis, so let's discuss today's movie and see where it falls on the scale. Today's movie is Rattlers from 1976. Now back in the 70s, there was a veritable cornucopia of man versus nature films, or nature getting its revenge on man, if you will. This pick is rather tame considering the subject matter centers around killer rattlesnakes. It's not a terrible movie, but it's not terrific either. However, if you're looking for a good, scary flick to watch at night with the family, then this one makes a great double feature with 1977's The Car. Both are mainly bloodless films, but deliver enough chills for an evening of fun movie watching. The copy I watched was from a three DVD multi-pack called Drive-In Classics, over 12 hours, nine frightfully fun drive-in classics. It's not a bad set. I've had it for a few years, and this film always stood out as one of the better ones in the collection. Rattlers was directed by John McCauley, whose only other picture was 1985's Deadly Intruder, which is about an escaped serial killer starring Danny Bonaducci. I couldn't find much about Macaulay online except that he also produced and co-wrote Rattlers. Okay, so the film opens with what appears to be two families camping in a large RV near a small California desert town, a la Race with the Devil or The Hills Have Eyes. You know, I really don't remember my family back in the 70s saying, hey, let's get an RV and go camping out in the middle of the desert where any number of crazy things can menace or kill us. But apparently it was a very popular pastime back then. Anywho, two young boys ask one of the moms if they can go exploring, which she allows as long as they are back by dinner. Oh yeah, and they have to bring a couple of beers to their dads and no sipping. Of course, you know how kids are. One ends up taking a sip of the beers. And the only reason I point this out is you could never have this scene today. You know, it's this totally 70s scene. In fact, I was hoping that they'd start a game of jarts. Ah, oh, jarts. I miss jarts. Anyway, the boys go off to see a real live skeleton, and the parents laugh it off and wish them well. Sure enough, they climb a ledge in a ravine, only to find... Rattlesnakes! A whole bunch of them. Quickly, the kids are attacked and fall into the bed of snakes. Cut to the title of the movie, just in case you hadn't already figured it out. We then are introduced to our hero, Dr. Tom Parkinson. Yes, an unfortunate last name, who's a herpetologist and professor at a Los Angeles university, played by Sam Chu, who looks like the poor man's John Cryer. Sam Chu is a journeyman actor who has been in, a, he's actually had quite a few leading roles, including this movie. He's played both John F. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, as well as being in the 1980 film Serial, and tons of TV shows, including The Bionic Woman, The Incredible Hulk. And also the Charles Bronson flick, Kinjite, Forbidden Subjects. Nowadays, he's probably best known as the voice of Shark Week on the Discovery Channel. So, Tom gets a letter from a local sheriff who wants him to come and investigate some supposed snake-related deaths. Before he leaves, Tom ends up saving his co-worker, Howard, from a deadly cobra attack. And while we get to see Tom's snake wrangling prowess, this sets him up for being the right man for the job. So Tom, sporting an awesome 70s leisure jacket, mine's better, heads out to the town and meets up with the sheriff, who expected Tom to be a dried up old desert rat with snake bite scars all over his body. <laughs> Before he shows Tom the bodies of the two kids from the beginning, he offhandedly mentions that an old man's body was found last month riddled with what they deem to be snake bites. Tom takes a brief gander at the two bodies of the kids, and he's clearly unnerved. 
the sheriff mentions that it's strictly closed coffin bodies. Unfortunately, we don't get to see them because this is a PG film, but it's clear that they're bitten all over and swollen as crap, probably even green. I don't know. I see them as being green. Tom confirms that they are indeed rattlesnake bites. Tom explains that it's highly uncommon for more than one rattlesnake to attack the same person because they generally don't gather in groups, except maybe when they're hibernating or to protect their nest. Moreover, the old man from the month prior was sleeping when he was attacked, and it's unusual for snakes to attack a non-moving victim. In fact, they're not naturally aggressive, and the rattlesnake will use their rattles to warn enemies away before engaging in combat. No, not that kind of rattle. So, a deputy brings Tom out to the canyon where the kids were killed, and we learn that the police investigation may have been a little lackluster, but Tom does manage to find a clue in the form of a piece of torn cloth with blood on it, which may have belonged to one of the boys from the beginning. Meanwhile, a kid named Rick arrives at his parents' farm in a cool muscle car. After the mother yells at him for having a noisy muffler, <laughs> he's ordered to go down to the stables and get his father for dinner. Along the way, he finds his dog dead and some dead chickens. He doesn't find the father and ends up being attacked by rattlesnakes and accidentally sets the barn on fire. Meanwhile, the mother, while trying to get dinner, the dinner table ready, is also attacked by the snakes, and it's over for the farmers. Forget it, they're toast. So Tom goes back to the university, gets another call from the sheriff asking him to come back to find out where the snakes are coming from, but this time he'll be partnered with a photographer. Tom goes back and learns to his horror that his partner is a woman. This goes against his stereotypical 1970s male chauvinism and really pisses him off. But the sheriff explains to him that Anne is the best photographer around and besides, she's pretty. They get word that a glider pilot went down and Tom puts his prejudice aside as him and Anne suddenly become Mulder and Scully. They go to a hospital to interview the glider pilot, and the tale he tells of how he had engine trouble, had to land, then got attacked by the Rattlers, was so exciting that apparently it probably would have cost too much to film, so they didn't film it, and we only hear about it. Tom and Ann go out to investigate the crash site, but it's late, so they end up pitching tents and having to sleep the night through. Meanwhile, in what is perhaps the best part of the film, a hapless plumber goes to a lady's house and while working under the house trying to fix something, he's attacked by rattlesnakes. At the same time, the lady is taking a bath and she too is attacked by snakes in a scene guaranteed to make some viewers never want to take a bath again. The next morning, Tom and Anne wake up to start and start to bond with each other. Tom looks at a map and triangulates all the attacks and finds that in the center is a local army base, Fort Walton. <laughs> The investigators go to the base and meet Colonel Stroud in his strangely unlit office. They also talk to the base's chief medical examiner. Eventually, Tom convinces the colonel to lend him a helicopter and a pilot while Anne takes a jeep to investigate on the ground. This is a good move because it turns out the helicopter pilot is a wealth of expository information. And maybe inadvertently, he lets it slip that a month or so ago, he was ordered to fly a container into the desert and drop it into an old mine shaft, upon which was then poured a ton of concrete. Tom is now starting to put two and two together and goes back to the base. Anne has her own run-in with a rattler and ultimately meets Tom back at the base as well. Tom gives Colonel Stroud an earful, but the colonel refuses to tell him what's buried in the mine shaft and the two investigators are kicked off the base. Tom vows to get to the bottom of things. Okay, I'm going to stop here. I imagine you can probably guess the rest of the movie, but I really think you should kind of check it out for yourself. Now, let's talk about the rest of the cast. Sam the Janitor was played by Ansel Cook, who was in about 38 productions between 1973 and 2002, including Adam 12, Sanford and Son, Welcome Back Cotter, Little House on the Prairie, The A-Team, and even Everybody Loves Raymond. His movies include Grand Theft Auto, Down Periscope, and Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze. The Sheriff is played by Tony Ballin. You may remember him as the henchman known as Knapp on the 1966 Batman TV series. He also had parts on Daniel Boone, The Partridge Family, Starsky and Hutch, Arc 2, The Love Boat, Fantasy Island, Vegas, and Trapper John M.D., among others. Anne is played by Elizabeth Chauvet, and she really wasn't in much of anything else. 
The Lady in the Tub is played by Celia Milius, who had a rather lackluster career, but she was married to the great John Milius, who wrote a plethora of well-known and well-received movies, including Dirty Harry, Magnum Force, Big Wednesday, Apocalypse Now, 1941, Conan the Barbarian, and Red Dawn. Celia herself did manage to get an uncredited part in Conan, though. Colonel Stroud is played by Dan Priest, who was in many TV shows from the 60s to the 90s, most notably Days of Our Lives, Airwolf, Little House on the Prairie, and he was also in the film I Still Know What You Did Last Summer. I did? I, I mean, I still do? One actor I did want to mention that shows up later in the film is Darwin Jostin, who plays a hapless soldier named Palmer. He's probably the most prolific actor in this pick, and is most famous for playing the character Napoleon Wilson in John Carpenter's masterpiece, Assault on Precinct 13. The following year, he was in David Lynch's bizarre film, Eraserhead. In 1980, he teamed up with John Carpenter again, this time for The Fog, where he played a character named Dr. Fives, obviously an homage to Vincent Price's creepy movie, The Abominable Dr. Fives. He was seen on various TV shows into the 1980s, and after his death in 1998, his family created the F. Darwin Solomon Endowment at the University of North Carolina School of Arts in honor of his career. I should also mention that Miles Goodman, who composed the film's score, composed music for quite a few shows and movies, including Lou Grant, Eight is Enough, Cagney and Lacey, Teen Wolf, the 1985 film, La Bamba, Real Men, K-9, Problem Child, What About Bob, Sister Act 2, Blank Man, and of course, Dunstan Checks In, among many others. Well, that wraps up the synopsis and creative people behind the film. We're going to move on to my handy-dandy, specially patented rating system. To set us apart from other movie review videos, I've devised the following scale of criteria by which to judge an obscure film either crap or not crap. Okay, first off, you have obscurity level. One means what the fork is this. Ten, it's widely known. Thematic elements. One is hitting you over the head with messages or morals, and ten is none. Picture quality. One is worse than old antenna television. Ten, it's popping like you were there. Story quality. One is a, a knock-knock joke has a better story. Ten, it's Oscar worthy. The acting quality. One is my senile grandmother's a better actor. Ten is Marlon Brando would be jealous. Gore level. One, Sesame Street's gorier. Ten, it puts Peter Jackson's dead alive to shame. Special effects believometer. That's a word that's patent pending. One, Birdemic was way better. Ten, it puts John Carpenter's The Thing to shame. And finally, is it entertaining? One, my whole neighborhood fell asleep. Or ten, I want more. Eight categories. A top score, a top score would get an 80, while the bottom would get an 8. On the crap scale, 8 to 44 is crap, and 45 to 80 is not crap. So let's see if Rattlers is crap or not crap. On the obscurity level, I gave it a 6. I've seen this movie on TV in the past, and I've seen other reviews about it, as well as various DVD releases, so it's not completely obscure. For thematic elements, I gave it a 5. Talked about um, women's lib and sexism that, that was sort of peppered throughout the film, along with environmental issues, so it gets a solid 5, and, you know, we don't have those themes bashed over our heads. The picture quality. While somewhat soft, the overall quality is surprisingly good. There's not a lot in the way of creative scene composition, but the movie looks nice overall. Story quality. I gave it a 6. I'm being way too generous here. The story is rather basic, some would say pedestrian, but the small talk between the characters in an attempt to flesh them out and perhaps make us like them was a worthy attempt, and I can respect that. The acting quality. I gave it a 5. Again, I'm probably being a little too generous here. But the main characters, Tom, Anne, Stroud, heck, even the sheriff, were solid. The others, like the helicopter pilot and Howard, were not the greatest, but I did believe that they were average people, and they didn't really deliver the lines as poorly as they probably could have. So, uh, I'd say they were solid on a mediocre scale. The gore level. I gave it a 2. It's a PG-70s movie, so there's pretty much no blood or even dead bodies in it, but it's scarier than Sesame Street, so I had to give it a 2. Special effects believometer. They were all real snakes. I don't think there were any rubber snakes throughout the film. And I believed all the snake attacks. And there's not a whole heck of a lot here that I could claim looked fake, although a lot of stuff took place off camera. So maybe they managed to maintain a believability level by not showing us cheesy bad effects. Finally, is it entertaining? 
I gave it a 6. It held my attention, the pacing was decent. Like I said, a fun family movie if you're looking for scares without the gore. So overall here at Cinema Enigmatico, Rattlers gets a 45. So Rattlers from 1976 is not crap. Well, by one point, but it still falls into the not crap t category. Some might argue that point, but who really cares? This is all just fun, and I like telling you about obscure films that you probably haven't heard of, and I like giving my opinions about them as well. So join us here next time on Cinema Enigmatico. I'm your host, Rigor, and if you can, subscribe to our YouTube page and hit the, hit the bell so you get all our alerts. Thank you.